This is Changing Your World with Creflo Dollar. Now, from the World Dome in College Park, Georgia, here's Pastor Dollar with today's message. You know, we've been talking about walking in our authority, the fact that God has given us use of His power. Authority just simply means making use of the power that's been provided. And the illustration we've been using is that the power company's job is to make the power available, but it's our job to make use of the power. It is God's power, but authority means making use of that power that has been given to us. We also may mention to you that the fact that when you have spiritual authority, you have authority as a believer, you can either empower God with that authority to bless you, or you can empower the devil with that authority to destroy you. And so to this morning, I'm going to talk to you about the origin of Satan. And I want to ask the question, who made Satan? See, you're talking about having the authority over somebody that you don't even know because you've bought the fables of the movies and you've bought the illustrations of what you heard and what somebody said. And I want to challenge your fables today as we get into the Word of God and understand the Word of God. So my first question is, is, is who made Lucifer? Now, now, I know who made Lucifer. God made Lucifer. Go to Isaiah 14 verse 12. I know, I know God is responsible for Lucifer, and Lucifer was an archangel of God, was one of God's top angels, and God made him, but later on we want to find out who made Satan. In Isaiah chapter 14, 12, you can see him referring to him, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning. And so Lucifer the archangel that was created by God Almighty. Now let's go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 28. And because of, because what I have to say is so radical and it goes against every religious thing you ever heard, I'm going to have to show you the scriptures. And in Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning at verse 13, Ezekiel 28 verse 13, again, we're just tracing down Lucifer, this archangel. And looking at some of the things the Bible already says about it. In verse 13, making reference to Lucifer, he's saying, Lucifer, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Underline that. So he said, Lucifer, this archangel of God, has already been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy, thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So this archangel had instruments that was prepared on the inside of him. That's how God created him. And he said, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Lucifer was anointed. Thou art the anointed sheriff that covereth, and I have set thee. So, God said, I did it. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. So not only was he in the garden of Eden, he was also upon the mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect. So this archangel, by the name of Lucifer, was perfect in everything he did and all of his ways from the day that thou was created. And then he said, until iniquity was found in thee. So he was perfect until iniquity was found in thee. And then we know that in spite of that, in spite of what all I just read to you, he became prideful, he turned into Satan, and he rebelled against God. Now we need to figure out what happened. See, now at this point, popular theology also says that Satan convinced a third of the angels to follow him. How many of you have heard that before? Isn't that amazing? Almost everybody in here has heard that. That he convinced a third of his angels to follow him, 
and to rebel against God. And I'm going to tell you, I got to tell you something right now. He could have, he could have convinced a hundred, he could have a hundred percent of the angels and they'd have still lost against God. Well, the theology said that they convinced the third of the angels to follow Lucifer and together they attempted to overthrow God and that they were defeated and then they were all cast into the earth and they based this premise upon one scripture in the Bible. One scripture. Listen, I, all my life I heard about a third of the angels were deceived and, and finally I decided let's go find where the scripture is. And there's only one scripture. And that scripture is so full of symbolism that it's bad Bible interpretation for you to create a doctrine out of one scripture. Look at Revelations chapter 12. And in Revelations chapter 12, you'll see where, where this came from. I'm going to read for context sake, verse 1 down to verse 4. See, it's time for you to know your enemy. It's time for you to know who you fight. And in verse 1, he says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of twelve stars, and being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was, it was born. Now, if that's where they got it from, that verse of scripture is so filled with symbolism, you couldn't possibly create the doctrine and deduce down to the fact that Satan deceived a third of the angels that, were, that, that, were, that, that came to earth when he was kicked out. You couldn't possibly do that. Even based on the laws of Bible interpretation, one of the things it prohibits is that you cannot take one scripture and use it to create an entire doctrine. And over our entire lives, all of us in Sunday school, everywhere, we heard that Satan deceived the third of the angels and, and they fell out of heaven and I'm looking for the scripture and this is the only one that I can find. So all of a sudden I'm thinking, something's missing. Something's wrong. I'm, I'm reading this scripture over again. There's several things I can interpret for, uh, from being, being, from, uh, to, to mean because of all of the interpretation from verse 1 through 4. And I'm like, that is not good Bible interpretation to use one scripture to create this doctrine. I used to think that Satan ruled over a period called the pre-Adamite civilization and that once he was thrown down from heaven to earth and then that God brought a, a, a cataclysmic judgment upon the devil and upon his kingdom and that the earth was completely destroyed between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. That's something I used to teach called the pre-Adamite period. In fact, go to Genesis chapter 1 and, and I'll show you this and uh, a, a very popular evangelist who wrote this Bible with these notes in it uh, made it very popular in the late 1800s and early 1900s and it's still in that Bible today and here's what he says this pre-Adamite period in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and so based on these teachings that this was the very beginning of creation but then between verses 1 and 2 there was a cataclysmic judgment that fell on the earth and then in verse 2 we pick up after that judgment and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the earth and so some really call this the recreation uh, rather than the creation anybody ever heard that before and and so uh, it was proposed that Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is actually the recreation so this certain commentary also said that Satan and his demons came from this pre-Adamite civilization. 
and that once Adam and Eve were created, God allowed Satan with all of his evilness and all of his corruption, that he allowed Satan into the Garden of Eden so that man would have a choice between good and evil. That's what I used to think until I began to recognize the true nature of God. How many of you know that God's nature is this? God is good. Isn't that right? And God is good. How long is God is good? God's good all the time, right? So he's good today, and he was good back then, right? That's his nature. How many also know that God is a loving God? The Bible says God is love. That's his nature. Now listen to me. <laughs> For God to allow Satan to come into the garden and to tempt Adam and Eve, that is comparable to letting your two-year-old child go out in the backyard and play knowing full well that a hungry lion or a bear is lurking around in the garden and could destroy them at any moment. Now, how many of you know that Child Protection Service would have a problem with you allowing your child in the backyard and you knew that there was a hungry lion or a bear that could destroy your child? For us to say that God allowed the devil with all of his evilness to be in the garden so he can go after Adam and Eve so that he could see if they were going to choose good or evil. It's just like saying, let my kid go in the backyard to see if he's going to sit there and get, get eat up or is he going to run. It doesn't go together. It doesn't work. That doesn't work for me as far as God's nature is concerned. God is not the one that's doing things to destroy you on purpose to see if you're going to choose good or evil. God is not killing your child so he can see if you're going to still serve him. God is not giving you cancer so you, he can see if you're going to still stay with him. That, God is not hurting his children. He's not beating his children up. He's not wounding and injuring his children. That goes against his nature. Are you listening to me? I don't believe that that's the way it happened at all. Now, the Bible doesn't totally explain why God did what he, what he did with man, and he doesn't totally explain why what happened between man and Satan in the garden, but I believe there are some clues. And, and I read the Bible, and I understand what the Word says, and, and I think that today uh, we're going to go at these clues because we're, we're fighting a devil, I believe, who's trying to just lie to us. The, the Bible says to be careful of the wiles of the devil. That's the craftiness of the devil. That's the, that's the deception of the devil. That's just the lies of the devil. And we have been buying fables. Religion has fed the church fables. And then when, you, when, when somebody examines it, you think, where'd that come from? That's just something I heard all my life. And then you go to the scripture and you can't find it nowhere in the Bible. Come on, let's get radical. Turn to your neighbor and say, let's get radical. All right, now, here's what I believe happened, and then I'm going to take you to Scripture and, and prove it to you. I believe that God sent Lucifer, his top angel, down to the Garden of Eden to minister to Adam and Eve. And Lucifer had not transgressed against God at this time. And Lucifer had not yet become Satan at this time. But God sent him on a mission to minister to Adam and Eve. Now, is that, is that in line with the word? Well, go to Hebrews chapter 1 and 14. Hebrews chapter 1, 14. It's imperative that you see these scriptures this morning. Is that in line with God's word? That, is it in any way possible that... God would even do that, to take an angel and send him to the Eden to minister to Adam and Eve. Well, why would he do that? Well, the Bible says of angels in Hebrews 1.14, he says, are they not all, referring to angels, are they not all ministering spirits? So Satan would be in the class of ministering spirits because he was an angel, right? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Adam and Eve, were they destined to be heirs of salvation? Absolutely. 
Was, it, was, was Lucifer an angel? Absolutely. So I'm submitting to you that God sent Lucifer to the earth, to the Garden of Eden, to minister to Adam and Eve. And what a perfect choice. Imagine how awesome the Garden of Eden must have been, and imagine Lucifer being sent there to minister to them and also provide some afternoon music. He had him in there from somewhere. Lucifer sent, was sent to serve, not to tempt. So originally he was sent to serve, not to tempt. He was on a divine mission. However, once he was there, the transgression took place. Now, I know that most of us, somehow in our minds, we've concluded that everything oper happens as you read the Bible in chronological order. In other words, you think I'm going to read it from Genesis, and everything that happens in Genesis, then that's what happens first, and that one happens third, and that, 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 that's what happened fourth. No, 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 no. I, I think the order is out. Of course, you can read the Bible and, and realize that this thing that you read in the, 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 the tenth book, actually happened way before this particular thing happened. So you can't just read the Bible as if the events occurred in chronological order. So he had not yet transgressed. He was sent, he was in the garden. Go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. I tell you what, this is, this, that's powerful. He was in the garden. Lucifer. See, God has a purpose for everything he creates. There's a purpose for everything. And when you don't know the purpose for a thing, abuse is inevitable. So here is Lucifer in the garden. I want to start off at verse 12 because it says something about Lucifer. Verse 12 says, Son of man, take up the lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Now, He's talking to the spirit that's behind the king of Tyrus, just like Jesus rebuked the devil that was behind Peter. And he said, say unto him, thou saith, thus saith the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of God, thou sealeth up the psalm full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen perfect beauty before? Well, he said Lucifer was perfect in beauty. Think of that. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You know, I saw all these people walking around dressed up like the devil. You have no idea. If Lucifer sat right by you, you wouldn't know him. He ain't got no horns. He ain't got no tail. He don't look evil. That boy, awesome. In fact, some of you cougars would try to hit on Lucifer if he, he sat by you. You'd be winking like, Lou. Lou, don't you wish your girlfriend was hot like me? <laughs> he don't look like none of those costumes. He don't look like none of the masks. He don't look like none of that. You wouldn't know him if he showed up. And I think that's part of the deception. You have bought a fable of what he looks like. You bought a Hollywood image of what he looks like. You have no idea. Perfect beauty is what God created it. Now look at verse 13. Thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. Check that out. So he was in Eden. He was in the garden of God. He was in, and this is, this is him in Eden before he transgressed. Him in Eden, it's not the evil came and then God created Adam and Eve. No, no, no. There was no evil in the garden. What does it look like? God creating a garden and it's evil already. There was no evil in the garden. He had sent Lucifer to the garden to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. So he was in the garden. And every precious stone, look at these stones, was his covering. Check that out. Every precious stone was his covering. Imagine how this dude looked. Check out Lucifer now. Covering, his covering. Sardis, topaz, diamonds. Can you see the dude sparkling? When Lucifer walked in there, he's sparkling. I started to ask my wife to hold her hand up and let me show you what he looked like. <laughs> sparkling. Burl, 
onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes. It was put on the inside of you in the day that you were created. Thou art anointed. And with all of that, now he anointed. And I have said it so. God said, I did this. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. But then he says, he's been to the Garden of Eden. See, something wrong with our, something's wrong with our chronological order. Thou hast walked upon up and down in the mist. Thou was perfect, perfect, perfect in all of his ways. Why not send him to the garden? Until iniquity was found in thee. Now for years, many have asked me the question, what was the iniquity that was found in Lucifer and what did he do to get it? And we have come out with pride and you, you see the results was pride and we've come out with the results of it, but what did he do? I'm going to say to you right now, what he did was not done in heaven. It was done in the garden. I'm going to prove all this stuff to you. Go to Genesis chapter 3. What he did... Mm, mm, mm. Let, let me say something. I, I need to give you some more information before I show you Genesis chapter 3. You know what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Might as well. Let's go and get it in here. See, here's the thing I like about this sermon. All of the fables you heard, you can't find it in here. The stuff I'm talking about, I'm showing it to you. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. God made it. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of the tree, eat the, every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said, You shall not surely die, lying. God, for God doth know it, that in the day you eat of thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. So, so notice He's trying to get them to feel like they're missing out on something. Your eyes are not open, and you're not like you're supposed to be. He's trying to get to, to shame them out of something. Sound like he's trying to get them to submit to what he's saying. Now, my, my issue is not what you've known to read in Genesis chapter 3. My issue is, why did he do it? What was his motivation behind entering into the body of a snake, a serpent, and what was his motivation for trying to deceive Adam and Eve? Got to know purpose. What moved him to do this? What moved this perfect being that was full of wisdom, so full of wisdom? What moved him to do this? Huh. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Check it out. Lucifer saw something, or should I say he heard something. He saw something about Adam and Eve that he didn't have. Because Satan says, I want authority with zero restrictions. And I want authority that's unconditional. And the only way I can get it is to get who he gave it to, to submit themselves to me so that I can have use of their unlimited, unrestricted authority. We have been buying fables. Religion has fed the church fables. And then when, you, and when, when somebody examines it, you think, where'd that come from? That's just something I heard all my life. And then you go to the scripture and you can't find it nowhere in the Bible. I feel like this is the last day for the last trick that the devil ever going to play on me. And I feel like it's the last day for the last trick that the devil is ever going to play on you. Hallelujah! Get your copy of Creflo Dollar's radical and empowering combo, The Truth About Satan. You'll receive this three-message series that exposes who the devil is and how you can stand and fight. You'll also receive this powerful mini-book, Your Authority Over Satan, to help you walk in victory each and every day. 
The Truth About Satan Combo is available for your love gift of $35 or more and will help you defeat evil each and every day. Or for a gift of any amount, we'll send you the mini book, Your Authority Over Satan. One of the most important offers this year from Creflo Dollar. Order yours today.